am Lee Sand Miller with W. Cushing and Company, and today it's Third Thursday with Lee Sand. Happy Spring! It's April, and this is in conjunction with Rug Hooking Magazine. I want to thank them for their cooperation with all of this. And this is the latest Rug Hooking Magazine butterfly on the front. So be sure to look through it. Great articles, great inspirations. Today, what we're going to go over is tools, tips, techniques. Uh, these are scattered throughout many videos. We get questions quite a bit, so I decided to consolidate them and put them all into one video so you can use it as a reference when you're hooking and to help you when you get stuck. The first thing I want to go over are the tools and then how to apply the tools to patterns. So the first tool that we like is the strip sizer. And everybody is aware of the strip sizer. It shows you the different size cuts, three, four, five, six, and up. But there's many different ways that this can be used. Uh, the strip sizer is a great tool to have. It's a great tool in your tool belt. If you buy a bag of cut wool, you can lay a noodle. Uh, just say I have this noodle right here. I don't know what size it is, but I bought a whole bag of this size cut well, it looks like an eight. It looks like an eight. Well, no, it's actually an eight and a half. So it's an eight and a half, and that's a great thing, so you know that that's what it is. If you have a bag where you've put in mixed noodles, or worms, whatever you call them, I happen to call them noodles because, well, I'm Italian. So here is an eight, and you lay it across. Great way to look at it. It is a little bit smaller than that. So there you are, that's how you would tell the strips. But that's not the end of the story for this. If you have a rug such as Let Us Be Silent, where you have lettering. So here is the rug, the rug is all lettering, and you wanna know it's single line, so the single line lettering really works. Uh, you may have to put it in twice, uh, we'll go over lettering in one second, but you wanna know what size to cut this. Well what size you want the lettering to be. You know you can do it in a seven. You know you can do it in an eight. Now watch what happens when I go to the eight and a half. The eight and a half starts to get a little bit bigger. Uh, eight and a half might be the limit because when you go to nine now, you're starting to infringe on the next letter. And the L might not be the place to start. Let's start with this E that wraps around particularly here and here. So if I want to make it an eight, okay, the eight works there, the eight works there. This way I still have my space for the E uh, and it works in here. But if I go to an eight and a half, I start to cut, the eight and a half starts to really cut into that space. So I can do anything from a five, six, seven, or eight. Now, when you go to hook lettering, and this is very important. So I'm going to hook, my size I pick is an eight. I want it to stand up. I'm going to hook my background because Lord knows there's a lot of background here. So eight. So I am going to hook in scrap wool, a size six. Size six. I'm going to hook all my letters in scrap wool. I'm go and I'm going to hook it as high as an eight. Then I'm going to fill in with all my background in an eight. I'm going to pull my scrap six and hook with the color I want in an eight. I have a small channel, a very small channel, and now I'm putting in a tighter one so it stands straight up. Think of it as getting into your jeans after Easter and all those jelly beans and those Cadbury eggs. It's a little tight, but you can squeeze in and they stand straight up. So this is how your lettering would look. When you do it in the two sizes, you go down two sizes. I want it in an eight, I go down to a six. Again, I hook it in a scrap, fill in my background, pull out my scrap, put in the real color in an eight, and it stands up so that you can read it. So that's the first, another thing that you can do with your strip sizer. The next thing is, is if you have a border. Okay, how many rows do I need in my border? Well. If I'm hooking in an eight, I have one, two, three, four. So I know that if I'm looking for my material or my border material, because we don't want to run out, 
I need to put four rows in a size eight here. And if I'm gonna go down to a five, okay, a five. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five. I need six rows of a number five. Heck, I'm going back to the eight because it fills in quicker and also my background is an eight. So this allows you, as you are hooking it or as you're color planning it, to let you know how many rows of color that you need for this border. If you don't, you may not screw up, but you may mix up and you may say, oh dear, I don't know what to do. So the other thing that you can do is, yes, we always seem to lay it this way. You can also lay it this way, right on. So here we go, we have a new pattern. I don't know what size I wanna cut this in. Uh, this is a Samya Scribble. It's a kind of a geometric, it could be any color wave you want. But I'm not sure, I don't wanna put in multiple rows. I would like one row of a nice color. So how am I gonna do this so I fill the row, don't overfill it? This is where you don't lay it this way, you use your points. You put it right down as the square. An eight fits, a seven I'm inside the lines. An eight and a half, I'm outside the lines. So if I want it right on the line here, I can do an eight. If I want it right on the line here, I'm a little over. I have to go to a seven. If I want it going here with one line, I use the points of it and there's an eight and a half. Yes, you can use multiple cuts in one piece, but this allows you to see how you do, how many, what cut you wanna use, how many rows you may have to use, the spacing of it, etc. This comes in very handy when you're doing um, an oriental, a Persian, anything in that matter where there is a lot of little motifs and there's layers upon layers of little motifs. So we know that this is gonna be a single line, but is it gonna be a four? Is it gonna be a five? Well, I use don't lay it down. Well, I lay it down, it's okay, but if I put the square right on it, the four fits it. If I want to do continue with a four, okay, so there's one, there's two, there's three fours that would fit in there, but maybe I can juggle it a little bit and put in a five and do one and do two fives and it fits just fine. But when I come up to the five here, like that, using it this way, I've, oh, I've exceeded the line, so I do have to go back down to a four. This is invaluable while you're doing a lot of motifs and so that you don't cut too much in the wrong size cut. It saves you on cutting, it saves you on space. Also because the motifs are all different sizes and you wanna make sure you get the most bang for your buck. If you were using a dip dye and you wanted to make sure that the draw of the color works and you only wanna do it one time, not two, by using this, laying it down, you know you can go to an eight and a half and then wedge it down, especially with borders. Eight and a half fits right in there, you're good to go. So that's the strip sizer. The strip sizer is very, very important. Another really good tool is our burling iron. The burling iron is pressure tweezers. Uh, they work really well. Uh, they work so that you can even your loops, or if you have to reverse hook, we all have to reverse hook at some time, you can reverse hook without damaging your linen, especially if you have to reverse hook in multiple ways. Here's the paisley from a few, um, few classes back. And if I want to come in here and even up a loop, uh, this, loop these two, this loop right here is just a little low, say. I get in here and I pinch it together and I just tug it up and then I tug the next, next one up. And then if there's another one that needs to be pulled up, I can pull it up. Now that's doing it one at a time. And you can even these out before or after you steam. However, if you have two loops or you really need to bring them up, you put in the two points just like this, pull them up nice and snug and they sit 
nice and snug. So you can do it as a single, just like this, where you've pinched them together, just like that, or you can pull them in here two at a time and even them up. You can even them up as you go along or you can even them after you press. It's a good way to make sure that you have everything nice and even, everything is the way it should be or how you want it to look. Now, if you want a reverse hook, you just take it from the bottom, which this is a pillow so we can't do, but you would just pull the loops from the bottom and I'll show you how to do it after we hook a little bit later. You actually pull it from the bottom like this so you're not pulling the linen, you're pulling the loops. These are great. These are also great if you hook with yarn. If you hook with yarn, a lot of times the yarn or velvet is slippery and you really need to get it in there and make them look like loops. So you just put them in and pull them up, one at a time or two at a time. This is the burling iron. Then we have scissors. And we have many different scissors. And I'm gonna demonstrate the duckbill scissors in a little bit because we're gonna do a, a tad of sculpting if we have time. So the duckbill scissors are great for sculpting or wall to burrow. Uh, they're also great just when you go to hook. You can't cut too low. You can only cut where you lay them down. This is your protection so you don't cut too much. As you're cutting as you sculpt, it gives you an even cut so you don't cut too much. And the duck bills come in two sizes, a travel or a smaller size, which I really like these for smaller pieces. And then the larger ones for just clipping your ends because I like to clip as I go. I don't like to leave it till the end or for larger sculpted areas. These are offset scissors. There's many different scissors, but these are just uh, two pair, not overly expensive at all. And these are a nice travel pair. They've got a nice point. If you've got to get down and clip a noodle or clip an end, it'll get down into tight situations and it will clip it very nicely and clip it at an angle. A lot of times we like to clip at an angle so that we can uh, hide it. So I have an end right here, it's kind of tight, but if I go in here with this little pair, I can snip it right down. And I can, and if you notice, my scissors are angled down and I can snip it. The bigger pair does not get in as well. The little pair gets into tight, tight areas where you can clip. And a lot of times when I'm done with a piece, I've steamed it, I've evened it out, I will roll it like this and I will continually roll it. Now there's a little piece sticking up that I don't like. If I take my little scissors and I do this, I get rid of it. The bigger scissors sometimes are just a tad too big, but these are good, they're good beginner scissors, they're good inexpensive scissors, and you don't mind if something happens to them, but don't let anybody cut paper with them. Okay, see here's another piece sticking up. So I could use the bigger ones like that, and that works for the bigger pieces. And as I go along, here's another one sticking up. You can use the duck bills. The duck bills protect the other loops and you snip them off. And so you continually roll the piece and you roll it until you get to the end. And if there are no more ends sticking, you finished. Now here's another one right there, but it's a small one. So I'm going to take my small scissors and nip those. So they are, they are the scissors that, we, that are great to start with. They're great to have in your tool pouch. They work really well. And this is a great way to finish your rug after your rug is finished to make sure everything is okay. So all the ends are snipped. And the scissors are entirely a personal thing, but they really do work. And when we sculpt in a, min, in a few minutes, I'll show you how the duck bills work for that. Hooks. I cannot tell you what sort of hook will work best for you. That is your personal. There's two things that really I have, you have to see or feel or touch, and that's a hook and a frame. They're very personable. Some people like the bent hooks. I happen to have learned on a bent hook. Your thumb goes here, it is ergo. It is a flip. It's a flip. 
It takes the pressure off your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulder. You're in and you're up. You're in and you're up. It is not an all the way down, all the way up. It is graduated so that you can do, this is a smaller hook, so you can pull a three, four, a five, possibly a six. The further you go down in the bend, the larger the hole, the wider that you can pull up. This is a lucky hook. This is really great for mixed media, for your velvets, for your arctic rays, for your fur. And this is held like a pencil hook or it can be held like this. It's so it's a smaller hook to get in there to add accents. It works in very tight, very small areas so that nothing slips off your hook. This is our straight ergo hook. Your thumb has its place, and most people start on the ergo. Again, this is a wider one. This is a six millimeter. So you can do a five, six, seven, and an eight. This is called the thimble on the hook. And if you go all the way down to the thimble, that's when you punch your biggest hole. As we get more comfortable with hooking, we forget to go to the thimble, and a lot of times we don't punch a hole big enough for the noodle that we're hooking with. The ball hook. The ball hook goes into the palm of your hand. A lot of people who have gripping issues or have problems with their wrist use this and they go in and out. Again, graduated from, and these are, they come in many different sizes, but they go in many different uh, graduations so you can use as many different sizes as you would like. Here's a pencil hook. If you hold your hook like a pencil, this is the one for you. This is an eight millimeter pencil hook. So it is our largest one. And it goes from a six cut to a seven, eight, nine hand torn or proddy. This works really well for proddy. Okay, to one other thing, and then I wanna get into showing you some demos. Binding tape. You asked about, but a lot of people are back to using the binding tape. This is typically what we would use, many different colors. There's a rainbow of colors that you can use. This is decorative binding tape uh, for your holidays. We also have it in different plaids. It's the, almost the same size, it's a tad smaller, uh, but you would use it the same as you would for a, bind, for a binding with a binding tape, and it works really, really well for that. So there you are. Decorative binding tape, and again, we have it in plaids and others, but for your holiday pieces, this works really well for a special binding. Ah, I did lie, there's one more. The color scope. The color scope is like having your own little kaleidoscope. This is when you take uh, colors before you start and as you're color planning, you lay them out very nicely and you look through them and you turn this and it turns like a kaleidoscope. As you turn it, different color combinations come up into the color scope. You can tell if you want the yellow predominant, the blue predominant, or the green. And if the colors go together, if they don't, you can take one out, put others in, rearrange it, look through again. Very effective if you find that you like to color plan, but you're never sure of your choices. A good little tool to stick in there. Okay, so now what I'd like to show you, and we have our frame. The first thing I'd like to show you, and we're back on, we have the Paisley pattern here, okay? I wanna show you how to hook points. And hooking a point really doesn't take much. There's many, uh, many ways to do it, but this has always worked really, really well for me. And it makes a sharp point every time. So I am going to come right here and hook a point. Okay, I have my ergo hook my six millimeter Hartman, and I'm pulling it up. Now, everybody asks, do I skip one, do I skip two, do I skip three? Here's the mantra. Slide down the loop, punch in, up and over. Slide down the loop, punch in, up and over. Down the loop, punch in, up and over. Now, here I am to the point. I'm gonna go one above the point. I'm gonna pull it up tall, just like that. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to continue the same. 
right down here like that and continue to hook. Then I'm going to lay my duckbill scissors right here, okay? I'm going to lay it right in there. Let's see if you can see that. There we go. And I'm going to snip. And I've got a perfect point. It makes a perfect point every time. And there is your point. The duckbill prevents you from hooking other loops and lets you snip that tall. You only have to do it on the first row. You don't have to do it on the second row. But if I want to really, really point right in there, okay. So I'm going to come in. Whoop. I'm going to come in with this. Also, I, I don't want you don't want all your tails in one spot. So I'm going to come one off from where I would start, pull my tail. I'm going to pull my loop here, and I'm going to pull my loop there. So I've hidden my tail. And then I'm going to continue along here just like this. I'm going to hook up to where I want to get to. I'm at my point. Here I am at my point. And now I'm going to come up like that. I'm going to come back over into here. And then I'm simply going to clip it like that. Another great point. Now, I'm going to, I am going to um, do something that everybody asks um, and people get confused with, and that's the French knot. And then I'll do a little bit of sculpting for today, and hopefully you've picked up some good tips or techniques. Here's tapestry needles. The tapestry needles come in a set of two. You can use them to whip with. You can use them for multiple things. They should always be in your tool pouch. So I'm going to put a French knot right there. French knots work for roses in bushes. French knots work for centers of flowers. They work as accent pieces. So I have left an inch on the bottom. I've left about an inch on the bottom. Now, this is not a typical French knot as an embroidery. I'm going to lay the needle on the linen, and I'm going to wrap it once, and I'm going to wrap it twice, but I'm not doing it very tight. Also, I'm going over the needle. So now the needle comes through just like this, and I'm holding it, and I'm holding it, and I'm still holding it. Now that little tail that I had down the bottom, I'm going to pull from the top and the bottom and make it a tight knot. Now I've got to anchor this. So I'm going down alongside the French knot. I am coming back up the other side and you'll see why in a second that I'm doing this. Okay, so I'm here. And I need to clip this off in a tight little space with our little scissors. I'm angling down so that it's hidden. Then I'm going to take the one inch tail that I left and pull that right up alongside. So there's our French knot. Again, I'm going to take the scissors, clip it down. So when I do hook around here, these will disappear. But also, most importantly, it is completely flat on the bottom. This can be used, this technique can be used on rugs that you want to walk on. So there's your French knot. Okay, we're gonna do a quick little sculpting before we run out of time. Now, sculpting Walderboro. Walderboro is very precise. You should not even have a toothpick. You should be, not even be able to stick a toothpick through. But with sculpting, there's a little more leeway. So I'm gonna sculpt right in here. Sculpting can be done if you want any dimension. Sculpting can be done as the center of flowers. It can be done uh, as a roof. If you wanted snow put on your roof, you can sculpt snow, you can sculpt bushes. And you hook these very high and you have permission to pack. And you can pack this as much as you want. The more that you pack, the better your sculpting will be. And you just come along 
like that. And you keep coming like that. And they don't have to be even because you're going to cut them. However, unlike, unlike your bangs that grow back, you can sculpt these too much and have to use your burling iron to pull them out. So there we are. We're going, and you can sculpt in any size. It does not have to be a two or a three. It can be a texture. It can be a dyed wool. It's always fun to sculpt the texture because you never know how it's going to appear after you sculpt it. So there we are. I've got one more I think I can wedge in there. Now, okay, so it's pretty tight. I can feel it's pretty tight. The first cut hurts the worst. So I'm going to take my small duck bills, and if you notice, I'm angling, and I'm going to cut, and I'm going to cut. They're my first cuts. It is an angle, like that. And for speed, I'm going to go to the bigger ones. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to lay on the top. And now I've opened up all my loops just about. There we go. So now I'm gonna come, and yes, it is messy. I should have warned you ahead of time. It does make a mess, um, and you do have to clean up after or vacuum up after. There you go. So here's the first sculpting piece. I used a dyed piece. I got some highs and lows in here. Nicely done. And there's a wide sculpted piece. It has a little bit of dimension to it. You could add, and if you notice, I'm laying my scissors at an angle. That gives me a beveled edge. And look how nice that looks. There you go. Okay. Then I did say I would tell you how to use the burling iron to take out hooking. Well, here's my hooking. I want to take it out. And instead of ripping, you just pull. See how I did that? I just put it into a loop didn't hit the linen, and pulled. Makes a nice way to do it. It doesn't hurt the linen. You come back and do that, and you're ready to hook again. So that's a good way to reverse hook. And by reverse hooking, effectively, you do not damage the linen. Other places you could sculpt, you can sculpt in here. You could French knot in here, French knot in there. There's many different ways to do this. So one more tip, and then we'll, I'll tell you what we're going to do next month. Here is the Gamekeeper plaid, and you want to use pieces of this plaid effectively. And you're hooking in an eight cut, but you're going to cut it this way. So you know if you strip this out and you just want this piece, you're going to do a roof or you're going to do a building, and you're working in an eight. You can get one, two, three, four, four strips out of this. However, if you really want this bold strip to come through and you're working in an eight, you're only going to get two. But we like to dissect plaids a lot, by, and I know that we've gone over this before, but this tells you how many strips you're going to get by dissecting this plaid. So again, another useful way to use your strip sizer. So I hope you've enjoyed the tools, tips, and techniques for this time. Next time we're going in the dye kitchen. And next time we're going to dye yarn. And I'm going to dye a tricolor yarn. That's my favorite dye formula. And show you how it's done. And you can do it in your turkey roaster. That's in, my, in the book that uh, Rogue Hooking Magazine and I put together. Or you can do it in the same pan that you dye in. So. Get ready, next, next month we're gonna be dyeing yarn. Have a great month, be well and stay well, thank you.